Away from the protest and outrage, Senate considers stiffer penalty for rapists. And with the banditry in Sokoto, killings in Kajuru, the Nigerian military says they lack manpower and funding. This is Plus Politics, and I am Felicity Ezewike. You're welcome to the program. The Senate yesterday canvassed stiffer penalties for rampant rape cases, as well as increasing brutality cases against girl child in the country. President of the Senate, Ahmed Lawan, disclosed this in his remarks to a motion considered to, consider, to condemn rather the increasing cases of rape and brutality against the girl child in Nigeria, according to him. Having in place stiffer penalties in Nigeria's criminal and penal code will serve as deterrent to perpetrators involved in the act. Joining me to discuss this is legal practitioner Abbas Idion, who joins us from Aquabib State. Thank you very much for joining us. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Now, when we read about condemnations against the heinous act of rape by the National Assembly, many applaud them, but more are asking, rather, why does it seem like our legislators are reactive with no end game to matters like this? Well, um, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit difficult, you know, for the uh, lawmakers because... Uh, our constitution is quite inflexible uh, to the, the extent that um, uh, with regards to rape and violent crimes, especially rape, it doesn't permit um, certain um, punishments, if you like. Uh, so um, I understand the kind of emotions that would attend such, uh, such a violent crime and such an event, such as what has happened. But unfortunately, with the way our laws are structured, it's very difficult to look for uh, a solution that would satisfy everyone with regards to the, the level and the, uh, the, the, how bad this crime is. So our lawmakers, unfortunately, were right by saying that it's not going to be possible to adopt a, a castration or a chemical castration of rapists. And we, we believe that there needs to be something done generally to strengthen our criminal justice system so that victims of crimes such as this can get justice. Um, they are conversing to for penalty just like you are, but there are those who argue that we have enough laws governing, you know, the issue of rape. There is the criminal code, the penal code, the Violence Against uh, Persons Act, among others. Do you agree we have enough laws? What really is the issue? We, we do have uh, a lot of laws around rape. Um, there's a lot of difficulty in prosecuting the prosecution of rape in our courts, especially with regards to uh, witness accounts and um, even the willingness of the victims to testify in detail. It's the harrowing experience to come to court to relive what uh, a victim went through in very difficult uh, circumstances. Um, but our lawmakers are also talking about deterrence, um, which, is, which is more of a uh, a proactive state of mind, um, uh, something that would prevent the would-be rapists from taking the act or the, committing the act in the first place. So while we've got a lot of laws that, uh, that would punish any rapist, but we don't have uh, sufficient deterrence that would, uh, that would deter any would-be rapist from carrying out such a heinous crime. You're talking about deterrent, and we're talking about castration. They're saying no. Uh, the, the penalties that we have now, is it enough to serve as deterrent? Because it seems that while we have the laws, the crimes are being committed on a daily basis. And even worse, people are killing their victims, not only raping them or assaulting them. Absolutely. Um... I think the, the um, debate in the House of uh, Representatives and, of course, the debates ongoing now in the sphere of public uh, opinion is to the effect that, look, if a rapist 
has committed a crime, the victim has suffered so much, has suffered greatly uh, from that crime being committed. And um, it's insufficient to just sentence the person to uh, a length of time in custodial uh, in a custodial center is not enough. What, what our lawmakers are debating right now is whether the issue of chemical castration can provide a, a deterrence upfront in combination with uh, what uh, sanctions, whatever sanctions the Constitution has prescribed. Um, and it, it, it would be interesting to see if that would provide a solution. Although doctors have argued that um, uh, chemical castration in and of itself, it wouldn't provide uh, sufficient deterrence for a would-be rapist. That um, a would-be rapist is more interested in committing the actual crime and nothing can deter him until he has committed his crime. So that remains to be seen. Okay, what punishment, just for the sake of emphasis, what punishment are there currently in our laws and what would it take to put stiffer penalties um, in a criminal or penal code that will serve as a stronger deterrent to perpetrators involved in this act? Rape is viewed, is viewed very seriously by our laws, and it's a, a capital offense, and any, any perpetrator of that crime has a long time to spend behind bars. Unfortunately, the process of proving the ingredients of rape is where we have a problem because there are a lot of loopholes where the perpetrator can get off and our prosecution system, frankly, needs a, an overhaul to ensure that we can, we can get these people behind bars. Again, we need to have a uniformity of our laws on rape because there is a, there's a difference between the laws on, on rape from the South and the north of the country, and we have a different set of laws for rape in the FCT as it stands. So we, we can unify our understanding of rape in this country and review the definition, because the definition of rape is also an issue. We have uh, uh, novel instances that are emerging today of various forms of rape. That would help a lot. Um, combined with um, a strengthening of a, a prosecution system that should be uh, sufficient to ensure that anybody who has perpetrated an, an, a crime such as this has a long time to spend behind bars. Okay, I was going to ask you the flip side of having so many laws. Are there positives to read at all? Well, it, it's, it's difficult to say. Um, so far, it's um, our laws, uh, if you look at the laws on rape in the, in the South, we're still talking about the criminal code. And uh, we talk about laws on rape in the North, you're talking about the penal code. And the FCP has its own set of laws for rape. And, and I, honestly, I wouldn't think that would be helpful. I think we need to come to a universal understanding that this crime is a crime against humanity. It's a crime against our women, our girl children, and it shouldn't be tolerated in any form or design. And we come to a, a universal definition of rape, which set, set uh, a standard for any uh, conviction or any prosecution process in this country. I, I know this question might seem naive, but it needs to be asked. In cases where we have video and pictorial evidence, where the accused confesses to the crime, why is it that we still have legal practitioners representing these people in court? What is the essence? Shouldn't the law just take its course when somebody says, yes, I am guilty of this crime? Absolutely. That question has come up in so many other instances. Why, why are armed robbers defended in court? Why are you know, uh, other criminals uh, that have confessed to their crimes defended in court? Uh, well, our legal system is such that um, you need to prove the ingredients of an offense, and everybody is presumed guilty until proven innocent. In that case, uh, um, a defense attorney merely stands to ensure that the prosecution does its job 
and um, there's no bias. And at the end of the day, the accused person, if duly convicted, uh, has gone through due, the due process of law, and then he can receive his uh, his custodial sentence as, as the conclusion of the case. So that's why uh, you have legal practitioners representing uh, rapists or criminals, even when there's a, con a, a, a confession and there are pictorial evidence or video evidence as the case may be. Okay, that, moving on now, let's talk a bit about, you made reference to it a little earlier about the girl child and their safety. The senator who came up uh, with this motion, Sandy Ono, bemoaned the lack of safety for the girl child in Nigeria. Uh, let me see if I can quote a bit of what he said. Our young girls may no longer have the confidence to live their normal lives. That's his word. My question is, Whose responsibility is it to foster this kind of confidence and how are they failing? Well, the responsibility for the, for the girl child, first of all, lies with the family. Um, our girl children are notoriously unprotected in the country where they're extremely vulnerable. And uh, because of the way our society is structured today, we, we have a girl child that's exposed to all sorts of individuals. We have uh, young children that hawk and run, the, uh, run around on the streets until late at night. And you can imagine what happened in, in, in Benin, where a young girl had to leave her house, had to go all the way to the church to, to read. Um, perhaps if she had power supply in her home, she may not have, want, have, have needed to go to church to read. Um, so uh, every, everybody has a responsibility to protect the girl child, but the primary protection of the girl child should start from the family, and then it would go up to the community, and then uh, we will be talking about the society at large. Um, I'll see if we can go. Um, let's just let's just talk about it. The there are some patriarchal um, behavior, some societal traditions that seem to encourage, you know, the kind of behaviors that are put out to young people, especially young girls who have been molested. Sometimes you have you have questions like, "What were you wearing? Why did you go see him?" Um, how do we change that narrative and ensure that the, the victims are not seen as the ones who should be having explain, giving explanation for a crime that has been committed against them? Honestly, I think those, uh, those views are ridiculous. What, what, what is the fact that a, a girl, what, what, what she wore, what, what does it have to do with what has happened to her, you know? Um, if you are robbed at an ATM, would anyone accuse you of hang, uh, walking around with your ATM card uh, to provoke an attack? So honestly, those those views are unfortunate. They shouldn't be accepted, you know. However, um, we need more education. We need to do something about around uh, pornography, which is quite pervasive now. Everybody has access to pornography on their phones. This, I think, might be one of the factors responsible for an upsurge in these violent crimes against uh, girls and women. We must do something about regulating internet pornography and the access to internet pornography in our society. Otherwise, other, other than that, we can also do, uh, uh, improve our curriculum and uh, sensitize our people about uh, uh, protecting our girl children and strengthening uh, the vulnerability of so reducing the vulnerability of our, our women in, in our society. It, it's been ongoing. The issue of enlightenment has continued. Uh, but it, a lot of persons are saying it is not doing the work that it should. Are we focusing on the right people? Should the focus be on educating the male child more? than just saying a general enlightenment? Absolutely. Um, anything that provides uh, a glimmer of hope in the direction of uh, giving us a solution to this problem should be encouraged. But you would agree with me that um, rape isn't limited to the girl child. It's also, we have uh, male rape ongoing. 
uh, it's, it might be a bit more uh, quiet or silent, but it's there. So the education should be, uh, I, I don't think it should be limited to just educating the male folk about uh, not raping the females. I think it should be for everyone in society to say, look, non-consensual sex is wrong, non-consensual sex is unacceptable, and no means no. Okay, um, I know I'm, I'm belaboring this issue a bit, but I need you to speak a little more on some of these prevailing attitudes that exist even today in Nigeria uh, that encourages uh, survivors to hide in guilt and shame. And this has, we, we know this has emboldened some of these perpetrators. What are some of these attitudes? Well, um, it's quite difficult, you know, for a rape victim to go to the, the police station and report the case of rape. Um, in the first instance, uh, there's the humiliation, having to explain what happened to you. And of course, there's the cynicism by which those reports are received by, which what you would say would be largely a, a male-dominated uh, police environment. So um, for a rape victim at the, at the time, there is the lack of believability from uh, family members. Um, like you said earlier, people would accuse you of uh, biting or inciting the, the attack on yourself. And uh, people don't tend to believe your account of the story. And because you hardly have uh, witnesses with uh, regards to rape, sympathetic witnesses that would be objective and state what uh, facts as they should be. It's very difficult for a rape victim who is expected to be completely lucid and give an end-to-end -end account, remembering every single detail in a very, very uncomfortable position in the police station. So you can imagine that um, eventually the statements that a rape victim will give will be used in court and uh, there may be some gaps in her testimony which the defense attorney may pounce upon to uh, render her, her, her testimony as being uh, invalid. And that would be, you know, the length of time it takes to even prosecute rape cases um, is very discouraging. And that might would uh, embolden some of these uh, uh, potential rapists who are, in many cases, very well connected, very important uh, personalities in society to continue to perpetrate this uh, heinous act. What, are, what options are there? I did a documentary sometime last year on a 16-year-old girl who was raped. The family only allowed me access to her on the grounds that, you know, I will blank out her name, the family name, and all of that. What are the options that families who are, they don't have much, they're practically poor, and they've become victim, how, what are the options for them legally to get justice now as it stands? Well, for a, a family, uh, it, it shouldn't be, uh, the, 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 your financial situation shouldn't determine whether you get justice or not. It should be in the interest of the state prevent crimes such as these. But I'm well aware that in many cases you have situations where the victim's family actually actively solicits for financial compensation. And many have argued that a, a level of financial compensation, in addition to stiff, stiff uh, uh, sanctions on the uh, rapist, may provide some measure of justice to, to the family of the, uh, the rape victim. Unfortunately, that, that hasn't uh, been passed. It's not part of our law yet, and it remains to be seen whether that will work. But as it stands today, um, in our country, it's less likely that a poor, vulnerable family will receive justice just because of uh, the potential that um, the rich and powerful have uh, to influence our criminal justice system in their favor. 
Um, there's also conversation around the transient nature of the crime that makes it oftentimes impossible uh, to prove in court. I, I spoke to a uh, public relations officer at, um, here in Lagos who said, police public relations officer, who said that in spite of the fact that they might not do the immediate test that is requested, there are other ways that, you know, the cases of rape can be proven in court. Um, could you enlighten us a little on this? Well, you know, when, when the act has, has been committed, um, I'm sure we watch uh, movies and we see the extent to which the law enforcement agents uh, secure the crime scene and try to take uh, forensic evidence from the crime scene because it's, uh, it's, an, it's an offense that needs to be proven step by step. It's a very rigorous process. In Nigeria, as it stands, um, our laws are centered on the, the fact that um, uh, penetration, whether penetration occurred and how, uh, what was the general situation. Um, well, it's based on the witness or the, the victim's testimony of what transpired. We don't rely a lot. Um, our forensic our capacities, the forensic capabilities of our law enforcement uh, needs to be strengthened. So that's why you can have uh, a potential rapist, a would-be rapist, getting off the hook if a prosecution uh, is commenced against him. So a way to strengthen the criminal justice system in that regard would be to beef up the police uh, forces' forensic capabilities so that for instance, in the uh, Benin uh, incident, so that we all we need is the ability to identify fingerprints and take DNA samples and then match them to uh, the accused person, and then you have uh, a, a situation where you have uh, an open and shut case and you have the conclusive evidence that this accused person committed the crime. Only when that is done will we be sure that we would... Um, uh, sustain a conviction in a court of law. Your quick thoughts, uh, you, you alluded to it a, a second ago, on the expectations for the case of Uwa that is dominating the media space. Now, what is your expectation when it comes to justice, especially uh, with the IGP having taken over uh, the case and providing more support for the Edo State Police Command? Absolutely. You know, public opinion has a way of shaping the response of our security uh, agencies to crimes such as these. Um, I fully expect that with the eyes of the public and public interest being generated and sustained in the conviction and prosecution of uh, the alleged, because I understand there's a suspect in custody, I fully expect that um, there will be no cover-ups and um, justice will be served only if they are able to tie in the suspect that has been arrested to the scene of the crime, being that, uh, unfortunately, Uwa died and she can't testify um, against this, this suspect, identifying him conclusively uh, so that um, we can, or a prosecution can be sustained and he can he will have his day in court. All right, um, just to wrap up this conversation, protests have been ongoing on social media and in real life. What is um, its efficacy in driving justice? Will it have any bearing on what becomes at the end of the day, especially if, um, like you alluded earlier, evidence is what is needed to prove cases? Yes, um, we have seen in America uh, where uh, the officers that were uh, involved in the George Floyd murder incident have been charged. Some of them, uh, some of them, their charges have been upgraded from third degree uh, murder to second degree murder. So that, that's the effect of social media and protests on uh, cases of this nature. Unfortunately, in Nigeria, once the sensationalism dies down, people tend to forget. But I am confident that with the, the state of our social media, and we've got a lot of activists on social media today, people will, will forget Uwa and 
we will continually press for justice. We just hope that the police have the right people in custody and they are able to uh, determine what actually transpired that night in that church in Benin City. All right, Barista Abbas, thank you so much for giving us an insight on this matter. And like you, we hope that justice is done on the case of Uwa. Thank you again. Thank you. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, we'll be talking about insecurity and the military's lack of manpower and funding. Stay with us. <laughs> 